Hello everyone, I think I'm just gone live, yeah, seems like it. Uh, welcome if you're already watching. Today's fun topic. Um, also, I'll try to make it informational, of course. Um, the topic is advanced tactics uh, stalemate. So when you're thinking about stalemate, it actually might seem very uh, easy, like... Uh, you might not really need to think about it, but um, there are definitely a lot of more advanced uh, tactics behind stillmates, uh, ones that you might not already know. Um, and yeah, uh, today I'll be showing a couple of those and we'll discuss the topic. Um, so I wanted to start with the most basic stillmate kind of, um, the one that you will probably see the most. Um, Stillman is actually funny because um, it's it's a bit strange that uh, perhaps we sh consider the uh, a stillmate a draw because in the stillmate, uh, for example, here in his pawn end game, um, you can see that White cannot uh, make any progress because at this point the king we cannot push the king away from e8, so you have to king e6. And we are the one giving a stillmate here. And it's actually uh, quite interesting that um, when we have a stillmate, it becomes a draw and both players get half a point. Um, it's not clear to me why that is the reason. Maybe we should give the one giving the stillmate more points. Um, because it's clear that White is the one who was pushing in this game. So maybe White should deserve a bit more points. But um, yeah, this is the way we... Uh, decided to do chess and um, yeah th that means that a lot of end games are actually not winning or you cannot really push because there will be stillmate so um, basically all pawn end games with only one pawn left uh, you can defend you have to be a little bit accurate here though because you have to play the move king e8 if you start with the move uh, king to d8 it loses because now you get this position and white pushes e7 and it's uh, black the move. So we should go king e8 in starting position. So after king d6, king d8, e7, king e8. We have the same position but it's white to move. Has to play king e6 and it becomes a stalemate. So um, almost all pawn lane games will be draw if there is only pawn one, one pawn left. Um, let's go to to another position that I want to show. Um, I'll give a few uh, quick examples. Um, one very well-known endgame uh, end uh, as well is the wrong colored bishop. Um, we have seen before that with only one pawn it will probably be a draw. But now we have an extra bishop. Um, and yeah, normally you would think that would uh, should be winning for the side with the extra piece. However, here um, it simply doesn't win. And the only reason for that again is stillmates so white can push and at some point you get such a position but the problem is that because this bishop can never control the h8 square um you can never push the king away uh from the corner so for example bishop c4 checking h8 um yeah there's no no way at all to put, get the king out of the corner and uh yeah, the most you can get out of this is a stalemate, actually. If it, if white were to have the dark square bishop, uh, let's say the bishop on c3, we would give a check, force the king to g8, and then we push the queen, uh, push the pawn until it becomes a queen. So, um, yeah, this endgame is a draw as well, also very well known. You probably already knew it. Um, so, let's go to another endgame. One that already gets a little bit more tricky um a rook uh, against the bishop most of you will probably know that this end game is a draw but it's not as easy sometimes especially if the king um gets on the back rank it will not be that easy because once the king gets on the back rank there will be some mating ideas and um as you can see white is uh wanting to play rook h8 check however the thing is that the king is in the right corner here or uh, yeah, corner opposite of the bishop. And it's actually rather easy to defend this um, because what, uh, yeah, there's simply no way to make progress for white in such a position. 
because once they uh, give a check on h8, you send them to go bishop b8, and you kind of put yourself in the stalemate, but there's no way to break this down for uh, the white side. Um, if you play rook move on the last rank, it's a stalemate, so the game ends. Uh, black cannot play any move here. And um, if you go back, then simply the bishop can retreat. And uh, yeah, we get a draw. So this kind of endgame will be a draw. It can be a bit more difficult, for example, if um, the kings would run to the other side uh, like this. If the king would be in this corner, then it could get a bit more tricky. So let's say we have such a position. Um, this, could, this could be tricky. And this position is actually winning. Uh, the reason for that is that we are threatening checkmate. Um, we can play a move like bishop b8 to block it. But after rook a8 we don't have a stalemate. We can still play a king move. So if you have such a position. Uh, it's actually winning for white. The only the move you would like to play with black here. Would be the move king to f8. Uh, trying to avoid the checkmate. But now we have rook to f7 check. So the bishop is uh, not so great on f4 here. So, um, yeah, then there's this endgame also, Rook against Knight. Um, with Rook against Knight, it's actually uh, quite easy as well. A rook against Knight is also a draw. Um, you need to be slightly careful, but it shouldn't be too difficult. Um, I don't have the position set up right now. Um, I'll try to set it up. Um, sorry. Uh, how do I do this? Okay, I don't know. Um, <laughs> so the the thing is, uh, let's imagine that this bishop is gone on f4. And instead we have a knight on f8, for example. Which already gives a check. Um, the king goes to f6. And you simply keep on going to these two squares. Uh, so f8, h7. And there's not really a way for white to make any progress at all here. Um... And I think a knight against a rook should be quite doable. Um, but now let's go into a bit of a more difficult endgame than uh, the ones we've seen so far. I wanted to go into... Um, oh, sorry, this is a starting position. Um, because this was a game of a friend of mine. And um, yeah, at some point they got this kind of endgame. And with the move f4... Uh, white managed to get rid of the f pawn and trade it for this g pawn because there's no way for black to save the f pawn here uh, without allowing the a pawn to promote uh, for example you could try to protect it with bishop d6 however now i think that white should be able to play rook d5 and there's no way to keep the pawn in f4 alive because white can always sacrifice the a pawn to grab the f4 pawn so this also happened in the game and now we get this kind of endgame. Rook against Rook and Bishop. And this is one of the more difficult endgames that seems rather simple at first. There are very few pieces on the board. So it would seem like it shouldn't be too difficult. Uh, because there are so little pieces. Um, the thing however is that yeah, it simply turns out to be quite difficult sometimes. A um, good example of this was actually the game between Caruana and Svitler. Um, they played a game, I think it was at a candidates tournament even, uh, I think in the year 2014, it was the time that uh, Karikin won the candidates, and um, yeah, Caruana was the side with the Rook and Bishop, and at some point, uh, Peter, um, yeah, I think it was Caruana who had the actual Bishop, and um, at some point, Peter spoiled the position and at some point Caruana was winning but then Caruana didn't didn't find the winning way so even at the very highest level this uh, specific ending can still go wrong um yeah the rook is of course a better option if it's against the knight rooks are better than knights um but let's see how, how black white can defend this so at some point uh black starts to push the king back uh, it takes a little bit of time before we manage to get the progress, but um, 
at some point as you can see the king gets closer and closer to uh, a back rank the king is already on the back rank if you want to start checkmating uh, the king we have to push it back uh, until the back rank otherwise they are not really mating ideas um, so black kept on pushing and pushing but it's not so easy as you can see it should be quite doable to defend this endgame but black makes a little bit of progress and the king is already quite quite close to the back rank you only need to give it one more check and um, yeah then the mating patterns will start to appear so this is already slightly uncomfortable for uh, white here um, so this happened king to a4 bishop c3 now for example uh, there are already ideas of checkmate uh, king a3 for, for example would already be checkmate in one so um, you have to already be slightly careful here with white and uh, Jordan found a nice idea to um, defend this endgame so um, if you're watching try to find a way to um, yeah for the moment find a clever way to uh, get the rook in a better position to make sure we are not getting checkmated and uh, let me know in chat if um, if you found a clever way here to make a draw there are some ways um, actually there is only only one way I think um, there are several squares on which you can put the rook right now after which it will still be a draw but um, the second move is, a, is the most important because what black is going to be doing is play king to c4 and then threaten rook a8 uh, which would be a checkmate if white were to do nothing um, so we need to do something clever with white here so the question is how do we do this yeah so someone is saying rook b5 check which is definitely a move and also the move that jordan played but the question is mainly what do we do after the move king to c4? How do we defend this? Because it seems like rook to a8 is coming. Uh, would be almost checkmate. We still have the rook in between. But because this bishop is covering the a5 square, um, black will simply take the rook and give checkmate. So black is threatening right now to give uh, checkmate in uh, 2 basically. So yeah, how do we deal with this? How do we defend this endgame and uh, make a draw here? Because this endgame should be a draw, but um, as you can see, it can sometimes get uh, quite tricky. Yeah, rook b4. Rook b4 is the move, and as you can see also in this endgame actually, uh, you need, sometimes need uh, stalemates to make a draw. Um, because if black takes the rook, it would simply be... Um, lost game oh uh, sorry i it would simply be draw because of a stalemate the king has nowhere to go and that means a draw so we have to go rook before check here which was what jordan played um king to d3 and now the thing is that black didn't have to take the rook so they can still keep on pressing this in game um the king is still in a mating net so it's still very very difficult to hold this so um, black kept on pushing and at some point you can see how difficult it becomes for white. Um, for example here, uh, Jordan was going up and down with this rook but now if you go up and down you have rook b1, take the rook. So you cannot do that so he has to move the rook away from the b file but now he gives check, king c2 check and now the again there are mating patterns again so the bishop will go to d4 for example king to d3 bishop e3 and then he will try to uh to give another checkmate so uh jordan went rook h3 makes sense cut off the king on the third rank rook d2 check king has to go to c1 if you go to e1 there will be rook h2 check win the rook so king c1 king b3 jordan played a waiting move which makes sense uh, but after rookie two here, um, it's it's getting uh, quite dangerous. Again, there's this mating idea with rook to e1. There's only one move again to save this position. Um, and this time Jordan didn't manage to find it. 
So after his next move, he had to resign. But try to find the, the only move here that makes a draw. Yeah, see, Anish Mods are also here. The reason why Anish Mods are here is because Anish isn't streaming. I actually saw Anish on uh, national television tonight. He was in a talk show uh, talking about the Queen's Gambit together with uh, other few uh, very famous Dutch persons, um, Dutch people. So <laughs> that's the reason why Anish isn't streaming tonight. Um... But yeah, try to find the only move to make a draw here. Did he put me on the straighter or what? What did he put on the straighter? This national TV thing or what? Yeah, I guess that's it, yeah. I was already thinking, why would Anish put me on the straighter? No, I ah, yeah, the national television, television thing. So people are saying rook g1, and that's actually the move that Jordan played. It seems to defend uh, checkmate for the moment being, um, but then uh, the move that wins the game here for black is actually rook to a2. So um, not only is black right now threatening to give checkmate, what he's also threatening is to win the rook. So if you play king to d1, rook a1, check king e2, uh, you will take our rook and then we lose the game. So after uh, Rook G1, Rook A2, uh, Jordan had to resign. Um, but there is a better move here. The move that uh, saves the game is actually Rook to D3. So that after Rook E1 check, we have Rook to D1. And there is no checkmate yet. Um, black can go Bishop to B2 check, but we simply have King to D2. And we keep on defending our uh, Rook. If Bishop C3 back, then King C1. And there is really no way to make progress. Um, maybe after rook d3, uh, black could try something like rook e4, but black can, white can simply wait on the d5, I think d5s for example, a good square. Um, so then after rook e1 check, we always have rook to d1. Um, and also after rook a2, it's important that we have king to d1, and there is no rook on g1, so after rook a1 checking e2, we are... Uh, out of this kind of box that we were in and we have avoided the uh, checkmate successfully so um, Yeah White had to play rook d3 there and save the game So this was a bit of um, Bishop and rook against rook, which is a very very tricky in game actually um, I Wanted to show a game of Anish in this uh, stream, but I'll, I'll I'm not sure at which point I'm going to be um, showing it first I think I'll go to a um, bit of uh, other examples um, for example this endgame probably most of you will also know it but um, I wanted to show as well why this is such a good example of advanced uh, still made tactics um, because the reason why uh, this endgame is a draw is only because of stalemate is a thing um, If there wasn't a stalemate the queen would usually win against the pawn um, But in queen versus pawn endgames, it's sometimes a bit tricky and we will see that here um, Black will try to make progress try to get his queen closer to the pawn while not allowing the pawn to promote Queen e7 King g8 Queen g5 check King f7 Queen h6 King g8, Queen g6, and um, yeah, at this point, actually, Black White was forced to allow this. Um, he could have gone King g6, prevent this Queen g5 check, but now Queen f8, and now we can never ever push this pawn to h8. So we have to keep the King close to the h8 square, so we are always threatening to push the pawn uh, to the promotion square. So King g8 was forced, Queen g5 check. We will go to f7, threat an h8 pawn again, uh, h8, yeah, queen, uh, queen h6, king g8 only move, queen g6. So we are forced to go for this position with white. And now the question is, which square do we go to? And it's a very simple answer. If king to h8, uh, sorry, king to f8, he simply takes the pawn. So we only have one other option, which is king h8. And if black gets his king closer, which is something he has to do to try and win this endgame, 
it's simply still made. We have no uh, legal moves that we can play, and we can simply claim the draw here. So this position turns out to be a still uh, a draw, because there's not really a good way for Black to make progress in such a position without allowing the still mate. If um, yeah, you have to bring the king closure at some point because otherwise we're never going to take the pawn. But we cannot do this without preventing the pawn to promote. So this endgame turns out to be draw. Quite complicated. I will need a lot of time to figure this out. Yeah, rook and bishop against rook is an extremely complicated endgame. Um, people, even the top players, need to rehearse the endgame from time to time. Uh, just because they forget and um, there are a lot of nuances sometimes. Sometimes also you have to figure out when you're winning. Um, because sometimes you're the one pushing and not only the one defending. So it's a, it's a tricky endgame. And um, it doesn't happen that often, so it's also not something they really want to study that much. But in the case it does happen, they want to be able to defend it. So it's a bit annoying, because <laughs> it makes you look like a bit of a fool if you lose it. But on the other end, it's not really something that you work on very often. So as we see, this endgame is a draw. Uh, but what happens if we push the pawn one square uh, back? Uh, so let's say we have the pawn eight six. Is it still a draw? Does uh, Black have time to uh, win the game here, or um, does 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 Black win here? That's the question. Does Black win or does White make a draw? And it seems like Black right now doesn't isn't able to uh, stop us from playing H7. So it's not so clear, but it has to do with the queen. If we if we keep on playing, if we play king move for example at some point. King g3, we allow h7, and then we get this endgame of which we've already uh, seen that it was a draw. So the question is, how do we make progress with black here? Um, and yeah, the answer is actually that uh, black makes a draw here. Oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I didn't intend on saying that. Black wins the game here, was what I was trying to say. Um, black makes progress by getting his queen closer, giving checks. King g8, queen d8 check, king g7, queen e7. White can never push because he's in check the whole time. And now, um, if we were to play king g8, we allow queen g5 check. And this is something we really don't want to allow with, with white. Um, because after king h7, for example, um, there's uh, black will improve the king. And the only legal move we can play is king and chate after we after which we drop the pawn. So allowing this is something which we really don't want to with white. Um, because you have to go to h7, otherwise black picks up the pawn. There's no stalemate, as far, as far as I'm seeing. So you have to go to h7 and you lose the pawn. Um, but uh, if you arise at this moment... You only have the, the only other square that makes any sense as well is the g6 square. King h8 is uh, actually also a move that we will look at, but I'll do that after we've looked at king g6. Um, so king g6. Uh, the problem with this is that you never want to get rid of the control of the h8 square. We had seen this as well with the pawn on h7, uh, that you never really want to go to g6. Because black can play queen f8. And there's really no way ever we're going to be able to play h8. Because the king can never support it. You don't really want to lose this control of the g7 square in such a way. So queen. So if we have this position, king g6 is simply answer with queen f8. While king g8, uh, we can give this check. Force the king to h7, we play a wedding move, and then we pick up the pawn. So um, this position, you just keep the get the queen close to the pawn, and then at some point you give this uh, this kind of check. We could, have, for example, also have gone to g5 immediately. Uh, that might have been actually simpler. Um, but one thing there was one thing I wanted to show, which is when, for example, the king goes to h8, and this position is actually mate in two. Uh, so if you're watching, try to find the mate in two here. Um, because what White is trying to do here is uh, push for h7, then go king g8, then go h8. But there is a way to uh, give, give White a quick death here. Um, 
this is made in two, but there is only one sequence to do it. So let's let's try to find that. And this is one that I've always really liked. Um, this uh, H pawn against the queen, and forcing White to uh, get in checkmate. Yeah. So Adija is suggesting the move already. The move is queen f7. And I like this move so much because it gives white only one option. And the option he has is basically um, allowing himself to get checkmated. He has to push his pawn, which is something you wanted, of course. But um, here it turns out that it's uh, black to move. So previously, in the previous position, we had looked at when the pawn's already on h7. And we had a very similar position to this. But the queen was on g6. And it was black to move. Here however the queen is on f7. So black can go queen f8 checkmate. So um, we can go queen f7. Force h7. And then give checkmate. Very simple. Um, but let's let's say black messes up. He plays queen e6. Attacks the pawn. But it's not with really a check. So he allows white to play h7. And now again this is a draw. Because now if you for example play queen f7, uh, we're too late because it's a stalemate. So to win this endgame, you have to keep on checking and eventually you will uh, or you should be able to win the game. Um, now let's go on to a slightly different but uh, very similar endgame. Um, let, me, let me have a look again where I have it. Yeah, here I have it. So this time we have a slightly uh, different situation. It's again a queen against a pawn. But this time uh, we are dealing with a C pawn. Or uh, actually this is an F pawn. Uh, but one thing I would like to say is there are sometimes endgames, as we have seen, in which a queen against a pawn is a draw. Um, this was the case with the H pawn being on H7. But this is also the case with an F-pawn. And because a chessboard is um, symmetrical, there are four files on the king side, there are four files on the queen side. Uh, this means that a pawn on c7, for example, with the king closed, would also be a draw, and on a7. So um, a queen against a pawn can be a draw if the pawn is on the seventh rank, and it's an A, C, F, or H-pawn. And it's uh, actually very simple also to hold these endgames. Because the only thing that you need to use is the uh, is stalemate. So, for example, here, uh, let's say the queen gets closer, pins the pawn, king g7, promoting. We're trying to promote. Uh, queen e7, king g8. Trying to, or you're threatening to promote again. The only way, by the way, for black to try and win this endgame is if the king could get closer. So if the king could be able to walk uh, near the pawn and then uh, try to checkmate this king before the pawn promotes. Sometimes even after, but especially before. Um, so here, uh, king g8, trying to promote again. Queen g5 check, getting closer. King h8, queen f6. Forcing king g8. And now we have king queen to g6. And now we have this question again. Where do we move the king? Do we move to h8. Which seems to lose the pawn. Or do we move to f8. Which blocks the pawn. So neither seems uh, ideal. But it's a very easy answer. It's uh, simply king to h8. And the reason for that is because black can never take our pawn. With the king in, his, uh, in the corner. Because it would be stalemate. So... Um, yeah, as I said, queen against f-pawn is a draw because of this stalemate trick. So, as you can see again, stalemate is a very important aspect to chess. Because it can happen in a lot of different endgames. And, um, yeah, you have to use it quite often to make a draw. So, um, yeah, there's simply no way to make progress. Here, um, officially, king f8 would still be a draw, but that's because the king would be so far away. That you're still in time to make this stalemate draw. So let's say black is king to f3. Now you go king e7. You threaten to uh, promote again. So queen g7 is played. King e8. Threatening promote. Queen e5 check. 
and um, yeah here you can for example play king to d7 black should play queen to f6 preventing the pawn to promote king e8 queen e6 check and now this uh, you have to go to f8 because if you go to d8 you simply lose the pawn so at some point by giving these checks black is able to um, to uh, push you to f8 because you don't want to lose the pawn the king gets closer again but the king is not in time because after king g7 we again have this stalemate thing we can go for this king h7 queen f6 and even if the king is so close it's not close enough because we have king h8 here again using a stalemate trick so officially king f8 was also draw but that's because the king was so far away if the king were already on e5 for example i think it would probably already be in winning endgame uh, let me actually show an example of when this can be winning if the king is close. Um, it's actually a nice trick I recently had seen. Um, so let's go back actually to the h-pawn position. Um, I think it's this one, yeah. So let's get the king first of all a little bit closer to show what I wanted to... Um, wait, why can't I move pieces? It's a bit strange. Okay, now I can. Um, no, I cannot. Oh. Not sure what's happening. Uh, let me refresh once. Maybe then it will work. Okay, yeah, now it works. So let's get the king a bit closer. Let's pretend like white wouldn't promote here. Let's say white plays um, king g8. I wanted queen e1. Uh, the specific position that I wanted was this one. Um, let's say white plays this move queen e3 yeah so this one this was the position that i uh no no let's get this one yeah this was the position that i wanted okay so let's imagine this position um and that this is not a queen this is a pawn so you have the e pawn against this h pawn um if it were black to move you would play e1 and then promote to a queen so we get this position and it seems like white is able to promote, which he is, of course. But it turns out that even if he promotes, it loses. Um, but this is kind of specific. Um, this was actually something that could have occurred in the recent Olympiad, the online Olympiad. Uh, one of my team members on the female board, she um, could have gone for this type of position. But she thought, okay... My opponent promotes, I promoted, uh, queen against queen, should be a draw. And she had very little time to see that it's actually winning. Um, but at the recent title Tuesday, I even uh, saw a Russian grandmaster, I've got his name, execute this perfectly. He saw that if I promote, my opponent also promotes, you actually win the game here. Because of queen e7 check. And um, queen eight, king h8, h6 is very simple because you have queen g5. Forcing king h7, queen g6 checkmate. But the question is mainly what happens if our opponent's king goes to g8? How do we win this? And um, the way to win this is simply by playing king g6. And even though there, uh, white has this queen on h8 that has so many squares to go to, um, yeah, basically has 16 squares to go to, or no, sorry, 14 squares to go to, uh, there's no way at all for white to prevent queen e8. With checkmate you can go queen g7 but it's we simply take it uh you can go queen h7 but we simply take it so there's no way for um yeah why to do anything here you can do nothing you have a full queen it's a queen against queen so it should be a draw but for some reason the queen cannot go anywhere so this is a position i would uh try to kind of remember because um okay sometimes it might happen uh, sometimes you can allow the pawn to promote even if the king is so uh, close. So the pawn, pawn against queen and games will not always be a draw because this can happen, for example. Do any of these ideas change when the side is reversed or is it exactly mirror of the current position? Yeah, so um, I said this uh, when you. Here we have an H pawn. We also just looked at when you have an F pawn. But if you move it to the other side of the board, to a C or an A pawn, it's exactly the same. Uh, the chessboard is symmetrical. Uh, both sides have four flanks, or four files, I mean. 
Um, so it doesn't matter if you have an A, C, F, or H pawn, they're all a draw. The other four pawns, so B, um, D, E, and G, they will always be winning. So if a pawn um, would be on G7 and the king on F7, for example, it would be a win. The reason for that is because you have no still matrix at all. Um, and yeah, it's kind of interesting that some pawns aren't winning and some pawns are. Um, but yeah, that's just the way it is because of stalemate. So, um, stalemates are definitely important in chess. Um, so let's actually, let's, I think this is the time to go to a Giri game. I was the, uh, when I saw that the topic of today's, uh, session would be advanced stalemate tricks, I had to, I, I just immediately thought of this game um the the game was not too interesting itself but uh especially the final part was because what happened was that at some point uh anish with white was playing shankland um in tara steel 2019 and um they had this end game which should be comfortably drawing for black he's not even down a pawn White doesn't even have a pass pawn, so yeah, there's no indication of why this should not end in a draw. But Shanklin misplayed it slightly. Um, the easiest would be, I think, g4, for example. King g6 is probably what he feared. Then king to d7. Um, the bishop moves somewhere. And you go king e6. King takes. Uh, king f5. And now the king is very active and uh, should should end in a draw. However, he started with the move king to d7. And he probably thought... Uh, I'm not sure even what he thought. But um, he thought probably that he could go knight h4, knight f3. And then pick up the h-pawn. Because he expected bishop f8 from Anish. So he went knight h4. Bishop takes knight f3. And it seems like he's going to win the last pawn. However, what he had missed was that Anish could play h3 after the knight to g1. He could take the pawn and then trap the knight. And suddenly after bishop to e3, there's no way at all to save the knight here. So it seems suddenly that black is losing. Because, um, yeah, white will take the knight. Then you will bring the king over, pick up the b-pawn. And uh, yeah, you simply resign the game with black. Because you're down a full piece and the pawn and it's too much. No way to defend that. So, um, Shanklin played king to d6 here. Only move actually to still try to make something out of this. Um, because Anish wanted to go king f5. And now he went king to d5. And the idea that uh, Sam had was that after king to g4, he could still play the move king to e4. And, um, yeah, if you take the knight, I take the bishop, and uh, black is even winning here. So this is really something you cannot do. Um, so you have to move the bishop here to some square. There are a lot of squares that you can go to, but there is no good square where you, uh, you keep on protecting all of these squares. So there's no way at all for uh, white to keep the knight trapped. So let's say the bishop goes to c5, you have this f4 square. So, if this were to happen, um, Anish, um, yeah, wouldn't be able to win the game. Instead, the move that probably Samuel had uh, missed was the move b6. And um, I read or I heard the interview of Anish uh, after the game. And the thing was that. Um, from the moment he played the move h3, I think uh, Sam seemed to be really unhappy. So it seemed like he he understood that he would he was losing this game, and um, Anish still thought it was a draw and correctly thought so. But he thought, okay, my opponent probably thinks he's losing, so if I play my move uh, with so much confidence, especially this b6 move. He thinks, I know as well that it's winning. He knows it's losing. So probably he will resign. Turns out this position is a draw. And it's, it's not even so difficult. 
um, because Anish Anish had seen this, but uh, Samuel could have simply played King to D6, King G4, King D7, King H3, King C8. And uh, what Shanklin knew was that if the king goes to a8, there is no way to make progress for it. What he didn't realize was that the king on c8 in this kind of position is also draw. So he thought bishop f4 would happen, he would be cut off, he could never ever go to b8, a8 with the still matrix. But um, yeah, what he didn't realize was that it was not even needed. Um, this is also a draw. Surprisingly, um, because the king can never be kicked uh, out of the c8 square. So what actually happened was that after the move b6, uh, Samuel resigned the game in a drawing position. He, he, it wasn't even so difficult, but he didn't realize it was a draw. So Anish, <laughs> the only reason Anish won this game was because his opponent resigned. Um, if he if he goes king d6 and he offers a draw, Anish will take it. Um, he doesn't even need to offer a draw because he can simply do this. And um, just go here, and uh, yeah, I will show that there is really no way to make progress for white, um, because the king can just go here. And how do, how do you ever attack this b7 pawn without it being defended uh, by this king? You would like to go with d6, c7, uh, but it's not possible because the king is covering these squares. So let's say you go king c8. Uh, sorry, let's start with king d6, king c8, bishop uh, e5. Okay, I can go to d8. Uh, but I can also force you, for example, to go to b8. But this position, Samuel knew that was a draw. Because um, we, the problem is that this king will always be defending this pawn. And there's really no way to kick out the king. Um, and if you go play a move like king c7, it's simply a draw. Uh, and we can also remove these two pieces and it would still be a draw. So... Uh, it was a very funny coincidence that um, Samuel, for some reason, just didn't realize this was a draw. And yeah, he, he lost the uh, game just because he resigned. If he didn't resign, he would lose. And this is um, not this position, but this position with the king on a8. Um, this is actually a very, very well-known draw. Um, especially without the pawn on b5. So let's say pawn on b6, bishop on g5 against pawn on b7. Um, that would be a very known draw, uh, well-known draw, and uh, Shanklin did know it, but he didn't realize it would be a draw as well with the king on c8, and I don't <laughs> don't think he will ever forget that. Um, so let's move on to another game, another uh, funny stillmate. Uh, I wanted to have a look at this position. Um, so we just had, what if you have a pawn against the queen? But then what also exists is a situation in which you have a rook against the queen. Uh, those kind of endgames. So, um, if you have the endgame of a sole rook against the queen, so without these two pawns, for example, so without the h3 and h2 pawn, it would be winning. It's not that easy, but it would be winning. Uh, queen against rook. So then the question arises, what happens if you add more pawns to the position? Usually, for example, bishop and the rook against the queen would be draw, or a knight against the rook would be draw. But pawns are a bit more tricky. So um, I had this very specific position, and there's only one reason why this would draw. First of all, it starts with the king uh, being cut off. Um, the king cannot go to ever go to the f file for example the king would be very nice in f4 would be very very nice uh then it would be winning where there's simply no way to ever cross this g file so how does black make progress well he, he wants to move the king to h4 and then put pressure on the on the white position he wants to go to um the h4 square then give some checks and uh, queen d4 queen e2 and then try to um yeah, try to get white base skin in a, in a zook swan. So let's let's show that. King g1, king h7, queen g2, uh, king h6, king g1, king h5, king g2. 
and now we cannot obviously play the move king to h4 because rook g4 so you have to do something with the queen first we have to get it to another square before we play king h4 so queen h4 check king g1 queen e2 um we play rook g4 queen f3 rook g3 check check king g1 king h4 eventually black got exactly what he wanted um it seems like um yeah why is simply lost here if if rook g8 for example um what what black would be doing is probably take the pawn rook g3 king h4 and again white is in the zook zone um probably even after rook g8 uh what black could also do is give checks and eventually go to a2 then have the double attack on the king and the rook but it makes also much sense to take the pawn and then uh, you get this kind of situation uh one has again to play the rook to g8 for example and um, now we can start to pick up the rook like this uh keep on giving checks and eventually attack the queen uh sorry the king and the rook um i hope you understand what i am trying to say um so we have this position and um it seems like there's no way to make a draw here so how do we how do we actually draw this with white uh, try to try to find the best move here and uh, yeah one the only move that makes a draw here it's not an end game you will see very often but I simply wanted to show uh, how often these still my tricks occur in especially end game um, still my tricks usually won't happen in the middle game of course because then the pieces will have a lot of squares to which they can go to but try to find the, the move here that saves the game. And it's of course connected to the theme of today, the stillmate, advanced tactics of stillmates. After this game, I'll move to um, the very typical theme of stillmates actually. There's one theme that's very, very well known. Yeah, the move, um, which is suggested by Peter Peterson uh, saves the game, which is move the move rook to g3, uh, rook f3. You could also try rook g4, but then after it takes rook g3, king h4 back, we get this position, and we have simply lost the h3 pawn, and we cannot give this check anymore. So now we're again, uh, we are in a zook song, so we don't really want to lose this pawn. So the move that saves the game is actually rook to f3, and um black can simply take the rook but then it's a stillmate so black can never ever take this rook and um then the question is how does black even make progress if he cannot take the rook he can go king g5 trying to go to f4 if the king does reach f4 it would be a winning position um but there is simply not a way to make progress here for uh black we can simply play the move rook to f2 for example uh, queen e3 and then king g2 and i think this is a much better setup than this setup we had with the rook on the g file because here as well uh black can never make any progress for example if he goes king to h4 back um we do not have a lot of moves but we can go rook f3 and it seems after queen e2 check um we are in a little bit of a nasty position it's a bit tricky but uh black uh, white has moved king to g1 again and we get the same position uh white black cannot ever take the rook because of stillmate and um because of that uh, that's uh, actually the only reason why this uh starting position is a draw just because of this stillmate trick so it's a, it's a nice example of how sometimes stillmates can save the game um what about Rook h4 after king g1. So rook g4 takes. Ah, so the thing is, if you go rook h4, you can simply take the rook, and it's not a stalemate. So this doesn't really work out. Um. Yeah. So the rook, you can simply take the rook there. I am going to the last example of the day. I think I might have one more example, but uh, maybe time runs out. I wanted to go to a game. I think it took place in the Dutch Championships. It's at least between Aaron Lamy, a known Dutch Grandmaster, and Luke van Wely, also a very known Dutch Grandmaster. 
And some point uh, in the game, uh, they got a very, very funny position. I'm not sure at which point it went wrong for Luke in this game. Um, but at some point they got this end game with two rooks. And uh, it's simply very, very nice for white because the rook on e7 is so active. Usually in the rooking game, uh, rook on the 7th rank is extremely powerful. Um, so, yeah, white is definitely doing quite well here. At some point, the rook will take the pawns on the queen side. And maybe this other rook can join on the 7th rank as well. And it will be completely dominating position. Uh, they will take on g7. They can take every pawn and uh, win the game. So, uh, this happened. Rook c2, rook b7, rook f2. Rook c3. And now, as you can see, this rook is starting to join on the seventh rank, which is something that's incredibly powerful in such rooking games. Uh, King h7 happened, so that after rook c7, uh, black could play rook g8, defending the g7 pawn, but uh, it's incredibly passive. This uh, rook on g8 is never able to do anything. And after the move rook f7, black is also not able to push for f3. So that only leaves one move basically, a5, trying to save this a pawn. Um, now the question is what happens after king g1? And um, simply, yeah, we cannot defend f4 anymore. So black pawns are getting eaten up and white is still very, very active. He's still having this pressure against g7. Um, rook b5 is coming as well with taking the pawns. King h8 happens, rook g4. And now uh, Luke went for the, uh, a desperate attempt, but he had to. The rooking game is so bad that he had to do this. Um, he played the move rook f8, and it looks very, very logical at first. But um, the reason for this is that he is maybe threatening to get active himself. So he wants to maybe play a move like rook f2. And as we've seen before, he wants to put pressure. But um, what happens if we take the pawn? Well, the reason this did happen in the game, by the way, and um, I think Erwin calculated it till the end. But um, I wanted to show this game because it's a very, very common uh, theme uh, connected towards a stalemate. As you can see, none of the pawns are able to move. We, and the king is also not able to move. It's got uh, it's in this box, so it cannot move. Which means that if this position, uh, we would not have any works on the board, it would be draw. So um, if black is able to give away these uh, rooks, then uh, he can simply claim the draw. So the next move by black makes a lot of sense. He went rook f1 check. He's trying to give away the rook. And um, the first one Aaron can take, but he cannot take the second one. If rook f2 check and he takes, it's a stalemate. So um, this is a very, very common uh, theme in stalemate that uh, you want to give away your last rook. I kind of forgot what the term for this was again. Um, I don't even remember it in Dutch for some reason, but... Um, it's a very well-known team and it's especially uh, well-known for the rook because a rook is the piece that's always able to like keep close to the king. If it were a bishop, let's say uh, you have a bishop and it moves to e2 check, um, you can simply move the king to f2 and the bishop will not have any checks anymore. And the same for a knight, it cannot keep on checking the king. If you have a queen that is a bit less common, um, and also the queen is in general not too interesting because for example if this were a queen you would go queen e1 check and you're forced to take it so the rook is a piece that's able to keep on checking but um, on the other end it's also something that you can at some point avoid because it, as you can see here for example what is not at all forced to take it um, so Let's see what happens if king g1 is played. In the game, king e1 is played uh, for a good reason. But let what do you guys think uh, what happens after king to g1? Um, 
it's good, Patrick, that you grew so much in the past year. Um, if you still want to improve, usually in that rating category, I will be trying to improve calculation. Um, but yeah, it's a bit difficult to explain it right now in a short minute. The language he was talking uh, was Dutch. Uh, because I'm Dutch, so it made sense. Um, so yeah, the move has been spotted. Uh, it's black the move. White is just play king to g1. And the move here is rook g2, giving away this rook again. And now we're also attacking this rook. So uh, it makes sense to take it actually. But it turns out that after rook takes g2, the king is still uh, in this box. The king is still unable to move due to the two rooks. And because of that, it's it's a stalemate. So the king had to go to e1 in this position. And the rook has to keep on checking. So we have to decide here with black, where do we check? And it makes a lot of sense to start giving checks on e2. Because if we go to e f1 instead, um, doesn't make a big difference. Um, I think it will actually kind of transpose to the game at some point anyway. So the question is actually, how does white avoid the checks because we're never able or it seems like we're never able to get out of this because the rook protects the f-file we're not able to go to e4 but if we go to the queen side we're never able to go to either c4 or b4 so how do we ever escape this rook that keeps on checking us and it was actually shown in the game it doesn't matter much if the rook goes to f1 or e2 uh, the king can go to the queen side but the question is how what does uh, what I do after so king to d1 happens rook to d2 king c1 um, rook c2 check king b1 now we had seen this rook takes g2 idea but the rook takes b2 doesn't really work out um, the reason for that is because we can take with the rook and now this rook on g7 is undefended so it's not a stalemate you can simply take it um, so rook to c1 is forced because rook b2 check doesn't work out um, This rook g2 idea we had seen uh, did work out Was and that was because in this position would still be stalemate So what white is trying to do in this position is at some point take the rook and Then not have a stalemate so it means that at some point he has to do something about this construction of these two rooks uh, To avoid this this stalemate from happening so rook c1 check, keeping on checking, king a2, rook a1, only move, king b3, and now rook a3 check. And again, uh, we can take it with either the king or now even the pawn, but it doesn't matter. Um, we don't we don't want to take this rook. If we take the rook, then it's a stalemate. Um, so king c2 was played, and white really doesn't want to take the rook. But um, white has improved this position meanwhile. He has run this circle around this pawn. And what he has achieved is he's gotten the rook on the third rank instead of the second. So suddenly his rook is on c3 and uh, instead of c2. And the king is not on the first rank. So the king has moved up a rank and the rook as well. And now Y is trying to do the same but with the other pawn. He's running to g1. King d2, rook d3, king e2, rook e3. King f2, rook f3. Keeps on checking, he can never take it. He goes to g1. Rook f1, king h2, rook h1, king g3, rook h3. Same idea again. And um, now we can see what white has achieved. He has forced his rook to go to over here. And now suddenly this king is able to go to f4. The king is finally able to escape this box. Um, at the start we could see um, this king never able to go to the f-file. Because the rook was always uh, guarding this f-file. But because um, Aaron has run these two circles. He's finally able to escape with the king to f4. But the question is how do we get rid of this rook? Because there is still the stalemate happening. Uh, rook f3 check. King e5. Rook f5. The rook keeps on checking. We have to do something with these two rooks. We have to disconnect them or something. King d6. Rook f6 check. Only check. King c5. Rook c6 check. And king b5. And in this position. Uh, look for really resigned with black. Because he didn't have any good checks anymore. He could go to c5. The problem however is that we can take with the pawn. And suddenly this pawn is able to move. Which means that we have no stalemate anymore. 
so um, you cannot go there and we can also not go to b6 the reason for that is because we can take with the rook and suddenly this rook on g7 is undefended and uh, there's no stalemate anymore so in this position there were no checks anymore to keep giving away this rook and uh, yeah turns out this position was winning it's a very nice it's a very nice position which could have arisen from a study very easily I'm, I it's it's crazy to think that this was not a study but it turned out to be an actual game so that's quite nice the, um and yeah this was um today's stream on still advanced uh stillmate tactics actually um i especially like this final final game because um the rook wants to give it itself away the whole time for like 20 moves in a row but none of the times we take it so i i like it a lot and uh, especially as it was with dutch chess as well so um yeah i hope you guys enjoyed today's um session i'll be back next week on thursday probably um so yeah 